Anybody might get lucky once in the world of innovation. But what we're really looking for is more than that. We want the ability to repeat the trick, to deliver a consistent stream of innovations in what we offer and the ways in which we create and deliver our offering. And that's what this film is really about. How might we build long-term innovation success? Now, imagine you're thinking about decorating. Now, <clears throat> decorating, you're going to need all sorts of things to help you do the job. Uh, for example, you're going to need something to sand down the walls and the surfaces before you paint them. And you might want one of those little cloths that you can scrub things with. If you're going to do some painting, you probably need some masking tape so that you can tape over all the uh, little infinicky bits of wood and other things that you want to do. Um, you might even need a bit of sellotape to actually stick around things. And you might need to write yourself a couple of reminders on post-it notes about things you forgot to buy in the DIY store, so you have to go back for them. Now, what do all these things have in common apart from being decorating accessories? Well, one very clear thing, they are all products from the 3M company. And 3M is a brand that you almost certainly have heard of through their products, if not their wonderfully well-known logo. And it's a very interesting innovation company. First of all, it's not a new kid on the block. This is a company coming up for 120 years old. It's got a huge global footprint, $13 billion turnover, 100,000 employees, and importantly, not just a few products, 50,000 of them. And it sets itself a challenge. It's a company that says, we are all about innovation. And our business challenge is simply this. We're going to get a third of our revenue from products we have launched during the past three years. Now, that's like trying to climb up an escalator that's going downhill. That's a really tough ask, unless you've got some kind of a systematic approach for doing it, which they have. Get lucky or get a system. But let's go back to their early history. Because like any organization, they began life as a startup. In this case, five gentlemen got together in 1902 and decided they were going to go into business. They were going to start a company which was all about abrasives. They could see the need for sandpaper in so many industries for preparing surfaces for painting and so on, in construction, in furniture, in the new car industry. They were going to hit this market. And they were particularly interested in mining the grit, the carborundum that you'd coat onto the paper to make sandpaper, which actually gave the company its name. 3M is the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. So that's how they started. And as a startup, they were a bit unlucky. They started with a failure. The mine that they had bought was going to give them Crystal Bay Carborundum. The trouble was that there wasn't any carborundum in it. It was a much inferior, less abrasive material. So they ran out of money very fast. They couldn't even pay their early wage bill. They could have been a fly-by-night failure. Fortunately, they had some patient investors who helped them keep going. They pivoted slightly. They said, well, let's buy in some sandpaper, some sand, some grit, and coat it onto sandpaper. Let's focus on the sandpaper side. And they built a factory in the town of Duluth in Minnesota. Uh, but their problems hadn't stopped there. They loaded a lot of machinery and supplies on the first floor, which duly collapsed. And so their wonderful startup again in trouble. Theirs was a classic startup hand-to-mouth business. But they managed to grow, they managed to solve quality and other problems, and at least get a toehold in the market. And then they had a stroke of luck. In particular, they met this gentleman. Now, this gentleman is a man called Francis Oakey. And Francis Oakey did not work for them. Francis Oakey, at the time, was an entrepreneur. He was visited by someone from 3M because 3M were interested in why he was buying their sandpaper because they wanted to market more effectively. What they discovered was that he was buying theirs and everybody else's sandpaper because he was assessing the competition. He had a great idea and a patent. 
he could make a paper, a sandpaper, which you could use wet. Now, you probably remember the problem with sanding things, particularly on an industrial scale, is dust. It gets everywhere. And if you could only use something that damped things down, that would be much more environmentally friendly. You wouldn't be coughing your way through the activity. The trouble is, if you wet sandpaper, it clogs up and it doesn't work anymore. It just becomes ugh, a very sort of flaccid kind of piece of paper that's wet. What he had was a paper that you could use wet, wet or dry and a patent. What he didn't have was money or time. He was a classic startup entrepreneur near the end. The gentleman from 3M who went to visit him suggested they might work together. Now these days we talk about open innovation and big companies are always on the lookout for other entrepreneurial ventures to buy in. This was 1920s open innovation. 3M invited him to join the company, paid him well, bought his patent, and in 1921 launched wet or dry sandpaper, which incidentally you can still buy for your decorating project today. It's a hundred year old product still selling very well. There's an example of 3M and its approach, particularly going out and searching for possibilities and being very flexible in how it handles its challenges. But there's another gentleman, rather important, this one here. His name is Richard Drew. And in fact, it was Richard Drew who discovered Francis Oakey. Now, I've got a soft spot for Richard Drew because he plays the banjo. And confession, I play the banjo. There are lots of jokes, generally unpleasant jokes, about banjo players. For example, what's the difference between a banjo player and an onion? When somebody slices a banjo, nobody cries. Bad joke, but you get the sense. But I like him because not only was he a banjo player, but also he was a hard worker. He funded his time at college by playing banjo in dance bands at night. And he applied to the 3M company for the job of lab technician as a way of furthering his career. And they took a bet on him. They invited him to join the company and he came on board, which was a rather valuable move. First job he did was technical sales, which is why he was out on the road meeting people like Francis Oakey. And one of his jobs was trying to sell the wet or dry sandpaper to the emerging car industry. Now the car industry, if you remember, characterized by Henry Ford, you can have any car you like, as long as it's a Model T and it's black. But of course, in the 1920s, people wanted more than that. They wanted color, they wanted different models and so on, and they wanted to customize their cars, which posed a big problem for the paint shop because the more different colors and different trim levels you wanted, the more you needed to mask the areas you didn't want painted. And that was a technology that really was very immature. They were using bits of wood and paper and newspaper and trying to stick it, and then they'd stick it on only to have the paint dissolve the glue. It was a problem. A problem that Francis Drew found, Richard Drew rather, found very early on. He went to one of these companies and he heard a real row going on in one corner. The painters were not happy. And he paid attention and what they were basically saying was, if only there was a tape that you could put on that would stay put and mask the job. So Richard Drew went back and tried to invent that and spent the next two years and all of his spare time trying to do it. He was a lab technician, he had some chemical skills, he played around. Now his boss, a man called William McKnight at the time, didn't tell him off. He said, look, I don't want you doing this in your formal time, but he didn't say, you will not do that, leave the company or whatever. He gave him a little space to play around on this, which was rather valuable. Because finally, after two years, Richard Drew had cracked it and he came up with a project, a product, which was effectively the masking tape that again, we can still buy today. 1926, masking tape invented by 3M, still around today. But what was going on there was classically an approach which says, we've got to be entrepreneurial. We don't have all the answers. We've got to allow people scope to explore, providing they still do their day job as well. And that tradition of what they sometimes call bootlegging, of spending spare time, has been a key element in 3M's history. We could go on. 
There are many, many stories about 3M. But in particular, one of the things that 3M demonstrates is the importance of building up a knowledge base and then exploiting it. The idea of building competence. And what 3M really learned to do very well was coat a surface with something else. Coat paper with bits of grit to make sandpaper, or to coat, and another of Richard Drew's great inventions, cellulose, which was an invention of DuPont, a clear plastic tape, to coat that with adhesive, which created scotch tape, sellotape, which again, we still have today. And 3M not only invented scotch tape, they also invented that rather handy little dispenser to peel it off. But their history is all about deep competence and learning to coat different things. They were pioneers in the recording industry because they were able to coat iron oxide onto film tape, which could then become the basis that the recording studios could use in the early days of moving from live performance to recorded music and recorded voice. Coating other things, for example, their sandpaper onto little scrubbing pads to clean dishes, coating different very medically precise things to make surgical tapes for medical applications, and much more recently, the post-it notes, coating non-sticky glue onto fluorescent bits of paper to give us one of the stationery store's most valuable resources. And they've carried on. 3M are still about coatings and competence, deep roots, they've invested in all of this. So we have a company there which is essentially one which is not an accident. It's tried very hard to think about how it innovates and particularly invested in its knowledge. But it's invested in something else as well. The gentleman at the top is William McKnight, who once upon a time was Richard Drew's boss and the rather indulgent boss who allowed Richard Drew to get on and play. That's been really valuable. And many of the things that William McKnight said and many of the systems he implemented in the early years, the 1930s, when he was chairman of the company, are still part of 3M's organizational culture today. Hire good people and leave them alone. Let them get on with it. Don't try and control them. If you put fences around people, you get sheep. Give people the room they need and let them play. And don't complain if in their playing, Things don't always work. A famous quotation of William McKnight, management that's destructively critical when mistakes are made kills initiative. And it's essential we have many people with initiative if we're going to continue to grow. What William McKnight was doing was laying the foundations for a culture which exists today, which gives people space. In particular, they have something called the 15% policy, and it's been around a long time. That's basically the amount of time you might spend if you took your lunch break and your coffee breaks and played around with your pet project. Went for a walk to kick it around, did some experiments, whatever. What 3M basically says is for 15% of your time, you have permission to play, to explore. In other words, giving them the sense that they can take initiative, they can innovate. Now, Let's take the big view of 3M. We could spend a long time talking about more stories, but let's try and take an overview and look back over their 100 plus years and think about how they innovate. It isn't an accident. They have a system. At the core, that arrow, how do they search? Well, they search far and wide and they particularly have, ever since the early days of Richard Drew going out on the road, they've listened to customers and they've learned with customers where the needs are, where the opportunities are. But generating lots of opportunities at the front of your funnel doesn't help. Sooner or later, you have to make some choices. And one of the things they instituted in the 1930s was a way of building their innovation portfolio strategically choosing a lot of safe bets, a lot of incremental improvements, but some longer term bets, higher risk, that would help them grow new categories for the future. And they have a way of implementing, which as we've just commented, allows people a lot of space and freedom to take things forward. This is guided. There's a strategy that drives this. There's a very clear sense of direction where are we going and why? We're going to build on our knowledge base, our deep competence, and we're going to take that forward. And we're also going to target new application areas. 
This is not a company that stayed around making the same old things for a hundred years. It's constantly pushing forward. It has a clear roadmap for innovation, a strategy. And particularly courtesy of William McKnight and many of the other early founders, it's got a culture, an organization which puts people at the center, gives them the space, the support, allows them to make mistakes, allows them to talk to each other. With 100,000 people spread around the world, a huge amount is making sure those people talk to each other. It's a company that has always been about linking up with the outside world, whether it's linking up with customers, whether it's building collaborative ventures with key partners, but essentially it was practicing open innovation long before that became fashionable. And finally, that green circle really underlines the essence of what 3M is about. It's an organization which constantly reviews, how do we do this? How do we manage innovation? What's our system? What works? What could we improve? What do we need to change? It's constantly being revised and reset. Its success is not an accident. It comes from a system for innovation, which they constantly review.